Don't you wonder if he's going to make a mistake once in a while? <laughs> Good morning. My name is Alan Milne, and I'd like to welcome you to Bethlehem United Methodist Church on this wonderful and glorious Sunday morning. This morning, as I was driving in earlier, there were three things happening. The sun was shining, it was pouring down rain on my car, and there was a rainbow in front of me. What a glorious Sunday. We're glad you're here to worship with us today. Please sign the attendance fol folders, which you'll find at the end of the pew, not really a folder, a little clipboard, and uh, provide any updates to your information. If you're a part of this church, if you're a visitor, please fill it out. We'd like to take the opportunity to welcome you. If you're a guest, we love that information, as I said. You also notice in the pew pockets, there's a card. Looks like this. This is our encouragement card. If there's somebody that you know who needs a little bit of encouragement because of either a health issue or some other concern, take time to fill it out and mail it to them. If they're a member of the church and you don't have their address, just fill it out, put their name on it, and drop it into the collection plate, and the church will mail it out for you. As a reminder, we have a nursery for children up to age two. We have Kids Corner for three years and through the first grade, and we have the Children's Church as well, so take that opportunity. Please refer to your bulletin for the announcements, but I'd like to bring a few to your attention now. Your bulletin has information on the upcoming Society of St. Andrews program for fruits and vegetables to the hungry. The program begins today and continues through November 17th, and we'll have a moment for mission with more information about that later. If you're looking for an opportunity to serve those who are hungry with a hot meal, join Bethlehem on the second Monday of the month at Stepping Stones Mission, located in Rocky Mount. We are in need of volunteers to help prepare, serve, and clean up for a hot meal. And we need them actually tomorrow, Monday, October the 14th, from 9 to 1. So sign up on the mission bulletin board out there, outside of room 112. Or you're good for tomorrow. Okay, you're, you're in luck. You don't have to sign up for this one. But please do, because they're always in need of volunteers. On October the 20th, the prayer ministry team will have a book table in the Northex after each of our worship services. People are welcome to check out a book on prayer during that time. Now Megan has an announcement. Oh, there she is. Good morning. My little monkey and I are excited to invite you to be part of our trunk or treat on Sunday, October 27th. We need volunteers and cars as we gather outside in the parking lot to welcome the community as we hand out candy and celebrate and uh, fellowship together. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to meet the children in our community and just have a good time. Susan has been announcing this on Wednesday nights that we're inviting you to bring snacks and we'll tailgate at our cars before we start at 5 p.m. and then we will hand out candies and hopefully have a hayride and some other fun things for the families here at church and the families in our community. So we encourage you to come in costume and decorate your trunk and um, be part of this fun time as we uh, gather together to celebrate uh, just fellowship with one another and uh, so there is a sign up sheet in our narthex and there's more information there and if you have any questions feel free to ask me we hope you'll be part of this fun event thank you now let us stand and greet our neighbors and pass the peace
Joy rings through the skies, for God's love is alive in our hearts. Gladness cascades like a mountain stream, for God's word brings new life. Delight ripples through the trees, for God's grace heals our wounds. Let your songs raise the roof, for God is great and worthy of praise. All our hymns this morning are out of the black book, The Faith We Sing. If you'll turn, please, to 2151, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. 2151 in the black book. May be seated and at this time I'd like to invite all the children to come up for our children's time with Megan so come on up boys and girls good morning it's not very often you get to wear a costume to church or dress like a monkey or we see Jensen already has her Halloween outfit on. You have a cat on your shirt and jack-o'-lanterns on your knees. Well, Ms. Maddie's dressed like a monkey this morning because we're talking about Trunk or Treat that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And Trunk or Treat is a fun time where we get to get together and we get together outside and we dress up and we hand out candy. I'm sure some of you will get to get some of that candy and we will be outside and fellowship together. And it's a time where we get to meet our neighbors and children in the community. You'll probably get to meet some of your friends from school. And it's just a good time for everyone to be together. And even though we're not worshiping in the sanctuary during that time, and, <laughs> sorry, and even though we're not doing a Bible study, we're still sharing the love of Christ with each other in fun ways. So we're looking forward to it. So go ahead and think about your costume now. All right, let's pray. <laughs> Dear God, we thank you for joy and laughter and for times together as we can celebrate being a family as part of the family of Christ and we can meet our neighbors. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> it's time for Kids Corner and Children's Church. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, boys and girls. Have a good time at Kids Corner. If there are any other kids that want to join. Megan was talking about the trunk or treat. We've not done that in the past. In the past, what we've done is an inside kind of uh, safe trick or treat. We call it back here in the Narthex. So this will be a, a, a new experience for us, but I know you know a lot of churches that do this where um, members of the church bring their cars and open the trunks and have them decorated and candy there, and, and the kids come and kind of make a loop. And what we need are, are, is your help to bring your car and... Um, if Susan Hughes were here, she would say you need to dress up, but you don't have to. I probably won't, but you, you might like that. And um, so it's a great way for us to reach out as a church and to welcome uh, boys and girls and their families here. And our kids can play in the playground and have a good time. So the sign-up sheet is on the welcome table. And speaking of the welcome table, welcome to guests that we have with us today. If you are here for the first time, and we have a, a couple of couples that are here for the first time, and uh, some from Wisconsin and Minnesota, I think they have, uh, are making their way south and settling here, and uh, so we hope we have a, uh, a warm winter for you. 
and um, come back to that welcome table afterwards. We have a gift for you to say thank you for coming and being with us today. And welcome to all on this morning. Um, we do have Alan coming to share with us a special mission opportunity related to the Society of St. Andrew. It's entitled Adopt a Bushel. Alan, come tell us about that. Thank you. I'm back. Uh, this is sort of representative of fruits and vegetables, so just keep that in mind. We've all enjoyed the wonderful fresh produce from our harvest table that we've had throughout the spring, summer, and into fall, and the fresh produce that we can buy from the stores. However, many of our neighbors don't have the opportunity or they can't afford to buy a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Bethlehem's Green Team is offering you an opportunity to support the Society of St. Andrew's End Hunger Program, Adopt a Bushel, Feed a Nation. The program is simple. We adopt a bushel. You can have an orange and name it olive. You can have an onion and name it onion. <laughs> A donation of $23 for apples will share 252 pounds or 756 servings of apples to hungry people. That donation of $23 would cost $375 in the grocery store. A donation of $54 for green beans. Now why beans are more expensive? Don't know will share 600 pounds of green beans or 2,400 servings. That donation, if bought in the store, would cost $1,206. If we raise $806, we will be sharing 41,000 servings of fresh, healthy fruits and vegetables for people in need with a value of $14,375. Please join us. Get your friends and neighbors, your children, your grandchildren to join in the program by adopting a fruit or vegetable or simply giving to support the SOSA program to end hunger. As mentioned, this program will run between now and Sunday, November the 17th. Sandy Kelso and I will be outside at a table where we have a display with more information. So please support the SOSA program. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. What I love about the Society of St. Andrew, it began right here in Bedford County. It's, a, it's not only a national ministry, but an international one that um, started out and continues to uh, salvage produce that normally would have been just plowed under or um, left in the fields or not picked. Or, uh, so it's not only using good produce to get to hungry people, it's uh, salvaging produce that would have been wasted so um, I, I bet it's because the green beans have to be refrigerated and maybe a little more processing that, that go in while they're more expensive but a lot of bang for the buck uh, related to this so thank you for that and after the service Alan will be in the narthex he has a table there and it will explain it to you and how you can contribute and uh, support this program to help um, hungry people uh, again, welcome to all. This is uh, a busy weekend for many. This is the weekend for the um, uh, Smith Mountain Lake Home Charity Home Tour. So a lot of our members are involved with that and maybe not here today because of it. It ends today, but it's been a, a wonderful weekend for it. So we want to continue to pray for that mission outreach and um, all the funds that will help local uh, ministries and uh, helping people in our area in need. I want to move us toward our prayer time. Um, the yellow insert is our updated prayer list. It's new each week. And you can see the uh, ongoing prayer request. Uh, college students, special mission um, relationships. Two weeks from today, we will have um, uh, Christoph Stupkai from uh, Seged, Hungary. We know him from Seged, he's now in Budapest, and uh, we will, there's a, a, f a few of us that are going out to Kentucky for our In Mission Together uh, gathering, and so we will uh, meet him and others that are from Eastern Europe, 
And uh, so we'll bring Christoph back, and he will be with us on that Sunday. And um, many of you who are, are not familiar with our connection with the church in Hungary will um, learn more about that. Next week, there will be a presentation for um, a couple of folks to share their experience down in North Carolina uh, for the hurricane relief uh, a few weeks back. So we've got lots of things to celebrate and to thank God for and particularly opportunities that we have to reach out to this community and to each other and beyond with the love of Christ. So we want to pray for all of these, and I'll invite you to join me in our call to prayer and see, by singing, Open Our Eyes, Lord. The words are printed in the bulletin, or um, if you need the music, 2086 in the black book. So we'll, let us be called to prayer as we sing. Lord Jesus Christ, that is our prayer, that you open our eyes, that you open our ears, that you open our hearts as we reach out to you today, as we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving and singing. Thank you for the chance to be here today. We're so grateful for life and for the beauty around us and your creation, for the opportunity to share out of the abundance that we have with those in need. So thank you for each other and our brothers and sisters around the world today that are meeting in houses of worship to praise your holy name. So may this service bring you joy. May it honor you as we sing, as we pray, as we listen for, for your word for us, as we open our ears, our hearts. Empower us with your Holy Spirit that we might be effective witnesses for you and leave this place energized and encouraged and filled with with your power that we might um, tell others and share others Jesus Christ our Lord thank you Jesus for your great love for us for your life that you have given for us that we might have life and have it abundantly and share it so thank you Jesus for each other we pray for those in need these on our prayer list others who are on our hearts and minds we're grateful that you love us and you're with us in all of life, no matter what comes our way. Be with those who are grieving today, those who are dealing with physical illnesses, those undergoing treatment for cancer and serious disease, those recovering for sur from surgery or facing surgery, those in rehab. We thank you, God, that you're with us all the time and you're with us now. We pray for the person sitting beside us, for those around us. We ask God that your will be done in their lives, that you meet their deep need. And we've all come here in need. We need you, Lord. We need your grace, your strength, your forgiveness, your power, your love. And so we open ourselves to you to receive that which we have that you wish to give us, and we give thanks. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, who taught his disciples to pray this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We worship.
by presenting to God our tithes and our offerings. Loving God, you are very good to us. You've blessed us in so many ways. You're so generous. And so we, in turn, want to be generous as well and to return to you this that belongs to you. And we ask that you multiply it and use it for the glory of your kingdom and the work of your church on earth. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So once again, out of the black book, 2152, Change My Heart, O God, 2152.
Our scripture this morning is from Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It is printed on the back of the bulletin if you would like to follow along. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for the people of God.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. I give thanks for you. That was powerful. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Robin. Will you pray with me? I have so much for which to give thanks. And I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. We're continuing uh, our series through the Gospel of Luke, following the lectionary readings for each Sunday out of the Gospel, and today is from uh, Luke 17. And we hear um, from these first words that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And Luke uses that phrase several times, beginning in chapter 9, to remind us that Jesus is now, as King James Version says, set his face toward Jerusalem. And so we get to journey with him along with the disciples, knowing what will transpire in Jerusalem. Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, uh, brought before the Roman uh, governor, sentenced to death, scourged, beaten, mocked, nailed to a cross until he dies. That will happen in Jerusalem. And not just that, we know the story continues. On the third day, on that first day of the week, he is raised from the dead. He appears to his disciples. He promises them the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, making them witnesses for Jesus throughout the world. And he ascends into heaven. So Jesus is on his way. This is the, the culmination. This is the last of his public ministry. He's on his way to Jerusalem where he will die. We too follow with him where we too can die and are invited to die meaning die to sin, die to selfish living, die to greed, die to the things in our lives that prevent us from living a full life in Christ, the life that God intends for us to live. Next Sunday afternoon, we're going to have some baptisms. We have a couple of young people, uh, Allison and Peyton uh, McAndrew, who have asked to be baptized, and we're going to have it at Susan Hughes's house in the spring, she put in a pool that has a spa, and it will be heated. And uh, so before she closes it up for the winter, we're going to uh, baptize these two young folk. And uh, just an open invitation, if you have not been baptized and would like to be baptized and immersed uh, in the spa that is heated, um, <laughs> talk to me. We'd love to include you in the baptism and invite all of you to come. Next Sunday is uh, Third Sunday Fellowship, so we'll be eating, and then at 2 o'clock we'll gather at, at her house and um, baptize uh, those who are asking to be baptized. And one of the images of the water of baptism, uh, we know that it's birth and life and growth, but it's also the water is an image of death. And immersion, baptism by immersion, is a uh, it's kind of really emphasizes that because you think of dying to Christ as like going under dying and then coming up is the new life that is ours in Christ so that is what Jesus is offering to us that death and resurrection that death to sin and new life years ago there was a, a, a church that held their baptisms down at the river and one Sunday as they were going to baptize a, a man they were making their way down, and it was a spring day, and it had been raining, and so the river was flowing pretty swiftly and was a bit swollen from the spring rains. And going down, somebody from the congregation said, Preacher, don't let him die. Which he answered back, he said, On the contrary, that's exactly what I intend to do. So Jesus' death and resurrection... 
us following him and our dying to sin and being resurrected is exactly what Jesus intends to do in us. So he's on his way to Jerusalem. And on his way, he encounters people. There are conversations that he has. He meets folks, um, things that he does. And that's why it's so important, why it encourages us to, to get to know Jesus, to listen to him, so that we can be like him. And so in today's scripture, as he's making his way to Jerusalem, it says that he is in between Samaria and Galilee. Now, there's not much in between Samaria and Galilee, so it's another way of saying that Jesus was on the border, that Jesus shows up on the border, and he's in a village, sort of a border town between Samaria and Galilee. So it got me thinking about the border how many of you have ever lived on the border, a border? And I'm not talking about Bedford County and Franklin County. That, that would include a, You have, Cheryl? A Laura? You've, which border? Okay, uh, city and county. I'm actually thinking of nations, <laughs> but that's a border. That's a border, and I will get to other kinds of borders. Well, you know, you think about our southern border, there's 1,954 miles of our border with Mexico. Canadian border, 3,987 miles of border with Canada, not counting the border with Alaska that separates U.S. Alaska and Canada, which would be an additional 1,538 miles. So that's 5,525 miles of border. I mean, think of the cost of that border wall, huh? How, how many of you have actually driven across a border? Not flown, because that's, you've driven across a border. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good many. And it might have been in Europe, taking a train across. Um, I think it was two, year 2000 that Cheryl and Mitch and I um, <coughs> traveled to Vermont and New Hampshire. We were on vacation, and we thought, well, here, since we're this far up, let's just keep going, and we'll go into the province of Quebec. We'll cross over into Canada. And so we drove. I don't even think then you needed a passport. We weren't going to go far. We just went a little ways up and stopped at the welcome area and bought a few souvenirs and came back. But we were, it's, it's, it felt different. You know, we were in the U.S., and then we were in Canada. We had crossed the border. And we noticed some changes, some differences, even just that little bit. You know, in the U.S., how and around here, you'll see these signs that are deer crossing signs and a picture of the deer. Well, they have that in Canada, but the picture of, of the deer has a little more flair to him, you know. <laughs> it's true, we kind of noted that. So Jesus is on the border between Samaria and Galilee, and we think about other borders, you know, those are kind of figurative, not just literal, but figurative borders in our lives that we, we set up, you know, we create these walls, these differences, these barriers, these borders, and Jesus shows up on those borders to, to break down those walls, to create unity. You think about the, the differences the divide even in our nation, it's kind of like you don't cross over those borders. If you're a, a Republican, you're over here. If you're a Democrat, you're over here. If you're a progressive, you're here. If you're a conservative, here. If you're, if you're black, you're over here. If you're white, you're over here. If you're gay, you're over here. You're, if you're straight, you're over here. Poor, rich, educated, uneducated, all the differences, old, young, able-bodied, disabled-bodied, well sick you know all the differences the borders that that we build up that we set up that we erect that jesus shows up in those borders to bring about unity and you think of paul's words that if we are in christ there is no jew or non-jew there is no slave or free there is no woman or man we are all one in christ jesus and last week for world communion sunday we sang that song one bread, one body, one Lord of all. One cup of blessing which we bless. You know, woman or man, Jew, Greek, no more. All one in Christ. So Jesus shows up at our borders, literal, figurative, to bring about 
connectedness, unity to cross us over. And while Jesus shows up at this border, he's in this border town, this border village, these ten men approach him and they suffer from leprosy. So they are on the border. They're, they're over here. They are among the unclean. And they want to become clean. And to do so, they need to be healed of their leprosy and present themselves to the priest because the priest is the one who examines you and renders you clean or unclean. And they have been rendered unclean, which meant for them that they had to separate themselves from society. They had to move out of the village, live outside of the village walls, be separated from their family, from their work, from their society from the synagogue, which in their minds meant separation from God. We've been studying Job on the, in the Tuesday morning Bible study. And Job, you know, it was common for them to think that if someone suffers, if someone has a disease and Job, you know, he loses everything and then he loses his health with kind of sores all over him, maybe that was leprosy. The idea was Job must have sinned. And that was the, the thought, that if you have a disease like leprosy or anything else, you're guilty of something. God is not favoring you. God is punishing you for that. And the whole point of, the, of Job is that, no, that's not true. And the question of why do good people suffer then, and it's not an easy one, and God doesn't really answer that one in Job. So there's this idea then that they need to be, these lepers need to be outside the gates cut off from God, cut off from family, cut off from society, separated. And I think about their loneliness. It's been almost 40 years ago that um, Cheryl and I traveled to India. Uh, I was in seminary, and there was a professor there by the name of J.T. Siemens, and he was, a, he was the, the son of missionary parents, so he, was, he grew up in India. He himself became a missionary, so he had lived more years in India than anywhere else. And um, so he was a professor at the seminary teaching missions. Every January term, they had a fall term, spring term, but then they had what they called J term or January term. And he would take a group of students to India for a study of Christian missions uh, among a non-Christian nation. And so Cheryl and I went. And we saw things and smelled things and experienced things that we never would have at any point other time or any other place and he was so um, connected there he, he took us to places that you wouldn't normally go like the slums of Mumbai there was a little Methodist church there that we visited out in the countryside there were villages where he had started churches and so we would go out in the countryside and visit where he had been and all kinds of places there and I think we all got sick you know but I saw things there, experienced things. One was that out in front of temples and places where tourists might go were people with leprosy. And they had lost fingers and noses and extremities and pitiful, left to beg. Sometimes they would have a little bucket around their stub of a hand with people would come and drop money in. And I thought about them, you know, just the loneliness, the, the isolation being cut off from society, left to beg. It was a pitiful sight. Mother Teresa once said that, uh, the, the, you know, the greatest ill and problem that we have in, Amer in the world isn't poverty or hunger, it's loneliness. So you think about people that might be lonely, maybe sitting in, in your pew, people that might have a lot materially, but are lonely, isolated, cut off. So Jesus shows up at that border, and these guys, they're so desperate. They want so much to move across from being unclean to clean. And so they call out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They keep their distance from, they cover their faces like they're called to to do and they're to call out unclean but they say Jesus master maybe they're kind of breaking the rules and they've come as close to him as they can because they know of Jesus they've heard of Jesus this is the end of his three year ministry perhaps and, and so this is their last chance he's on his way to Jerusalem and so they call out have mercy on us 
And so Jesus instructs them to, to go and to present themselves to the priest because the priest is the one who can say, after examining them, you're clean. And on the way, they experience healing. They're healed of their leprosy. And one, we learn, is a Samaritan. Now, think about that, that the Samaritan has been one of the, the ten, or maybe living outside. And you know the history, you know the story, the connection, the relationship between Samaritans and Jews, and that Jews hated Samaritans, Samaritans hated Jews. Jews considered them sort of uh, half-breeds, sort of the wrong race. They, they read the Bible differently. They worship in a different place. And no self-respecting Jew would be seen with a Samaritan. If you see one coming down the street, you cross over to the other side. But there's something about the disease that they've had, this leprosy that has brought them together, the commonality that kind of overrode, that trumped the disease that they had or trumped the animosity between the two groups. I was trying to think of an equivalent to that. And, and um, when I first entered ministry many years ago, I was still in my 20s, and I was serving these three little country churches. And in one of the churches was a, a man, he was probably mid-30s, who had been diagnosed with cancer. And he would travel from home to Richmond, which was about an hour away, to receive treatment at what was then MCB. It's now VCU. And so he, he was getting chemotherapy, and from time to time he needed someone to drive him there. And so I volunteered to drive him several times. And um, so I would sit in the waiting area because he would sit in the chair and do the, the, the chemo drip, and it would take several hours, so I'd bring some work to do. But I just noticed the people that were there in the waiting room, and there were all kinds of people, people who were uh, white, black, brown. You might hear some Spanish being spoken over here, maybe Arabic over here, people who were wealthy, I could tell, and people who were poor, people who were older, people who were younger. But what they had in common was they were there for chemo. They all had cancer, and you, you could see them talking to each other. They kind of knew each other. I'm sure that they had kind of developed these relationships over the, the, their times of coming there. One time he had to change his schedule, and we went on the day that the children were coming for chemo, and all these bald-headed children getting chemo, some of them looking very sick, parents looking worried and weary, and the kids playing games and talking to each other, parents kind of consoling each other. What was their commonality? It was the cancer. And so the, the disease of leprosy was their commonality. And so going together, they, Jesus instructed them to go to the priest, and on the way they were made clean, all ten of them. But only one came back, and he was a Samaritan. And he was praising God. He he fell down at Jesus' feet. He was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. He was loud. He must have been a Pentecostal because I can just imagine him praising God, raising his hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I am healed. I am healed. Could have been a Baptist. Did they shout? Did they shout and say, thank you, Jesus? Could have been. Could have been. Might have been a Methodist, you know? But he was grateful. He was so thankful. And Jesus kind of offered these uh, kind of rhetorical questions. Were not, not ten who had leprosy that I sent to the priest? Why is there only nine that have returned? Why is it this one who is offering thanksgiving and praise, a foreigner? What happened to the others? Well, we don't, we don't know, you know, what happened. We don't know. The, I mean, maybe they went on to present themselves to the priest. I was thinking about them, you know, their experience very different than the Samaritan because those nine, they probably just, you know, once they were healed, presented themselves to the priest, was considered, you know, clean. They could just go home. They could go back to their jobs, get back into society, 
go back to the synagogue, be welcomed back into the community, and maybe after a couple of years even forget that they had leprosy, forget that they had met Jesus. But that Samaritan, he would go on being a Samaritan. Still the hated, despised, rejected Samaritan. But it's interesting what Jesus said to him. He said to him, go, get up, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And that's a little confusing because we think, well, isn't he already well? I mean, he was healed of his leprosy when he was on his way to present himself to the priest along with the others. What does Jesus mean? Your faith has made you well. The word translated well can also be translated healed, but it can also be tra translated saved or made whole. So the nine, they were healed of their leprosy, but the Samaritan, he was made whole. In his response, his gratitude, his thankfulness to Jesus, it made him whole. And so I think about, you know, what this has to say to us about our own sense of gratitude, our own thankfulness. And I think about the things that I, I witness or things that I experience. Do I just kind of let them slide and I forget to say thank you to God for them? And the answer is, I do that. I'm guilty of that. And I suspect we all are. We have so much, but we take it for granted and we forget to say thank you. Wednesday night in the Alpha course, we were, the topic was prayer, and we were talking about prayer of praise and thanksgiving. And we were all saying, you know, we want to do more of that. We want to commit to that. Some were saying we want to uh, keep a gratitude journal. Uh, some in the morning, some in the night, uh, kind of begin the day, end the day with thankfulness. I, I try to wake up praying, wake up being thankful. Thank you, God, for the, the night's rest. This morning I woke up at, at 4 a.m. The, the moon was shining and I thought it was time to get up. Thank you, God, for another hour's sleep, you know, because I went back to sleep. Thank you, God, for this bed, for these covers. Thank you for the roof over my head, for food to eat. Thank you for my work, for this church, for the people I love. Thank you for my family. Thank you for all the things that come to mind just to say thank you. It's in that sense of gratitude, living a life of thankfulness, of, of thanking God, praising God, offer those prayers of praise and thanksgiving that makes us whole, that we get to experience the wholeness of God. Does that exempt us from illness and trouble and difficulty and other things? No, just like it didn't exempt the Samaritan from the rest of his life. But what it gives us is the presence of God, the salvation of Jesus, the forgiveness, the, all that Jesus has to offer. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for this account of Jesus healing these ten and making this one whole for the Samaritan. And so may we offer love and gratitude and thanking you for coming to us at the borders where we find ourselves. So may we be more thankful beginning today and to live our lives with gratitude knowing that you love us and you make us whole. We pray in your name. Amen. So we get to sing that song that the choir sang, the Give Thanks. It's 2036 in the black book. Let's stand as we sing it as our closing hymn, Give Thanks, 2036.
And thank you for worshiping with us today. Again, if you're here for the first time, if we have a first time guest here, we have a couple, come back through these doors. There's a welcome table you'll see out there. We have a gift to say thanks for coming. Um, Alan will be out there to give you information about the uh, Society of St. Andrew uh, Adopt a Bushel. Um, you can contribute toward that. And also the sign up is on the table out there for Trunk or Treat. And uh, so hope you have a blessed day, a wonderful week. Um, as we give thanks to God. The benediction is the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.